Hi everyone. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the new 750 volt generation 4 SIG FETs from United Silicon Carbide and how their characteristics enable higher efficiency and higher density power designs. The first generation 4 FETs being launched are rated at 750 volt. This is because we'd like to cover applications that need a 500 volt bus voltage. Um, and of course, the parts are usable with its traditional 300 and 400 volt bus applications. There are two devices here. One is at 18 milliohm, the other at 60 milliohm. They are both rated at 175C TJ Max. There's been a large improvement in RDSA. So the chips, in fact, are very small. And in order to achieve these excellent R theta JC numbers, 0.3 degrees C per watt for the 18 milliohm device, 0.75 degrees C per watt for the 60 milliohm device, a lot of wafer thinning technology as well as silver sintering technology is employed within these discretes. The low voltage MOSFET that is used here has a plus minus 20 volt gate rating, a 5 volt threshold, allows the switch to be operated with a 0 to 12 volt gate drive with a very low QG of 38 nanocoulomb. The third quadrant characteristics are excellent. There's just a 1.2 volt forward drop for the 18 milliohm device, a 1.3 volt drop for the 60 milliohm device in the third quadrant. Now, these low RDS on numbers come with very low operating capacitance numbers driven by the small JFET chip size. So you can see the EOSS column and the COSS TR column. These are very low capacitance numbers, and we will benchmark these against other FETs in later slides. Let's take a look at the target applications for these uh, new generation four devices. They are 750 volt devices so they can handle both 400 and 500 volt bus applications. They have very good figures of merits for hard and soft switching. They come in industry standard 2 to 47, three lead and four lead packages, and they have already been qualified to the AEC Q101 standard. So in the automotive space, they're very useful for onboard chargers where a totem pole PFC like arrangement can be used and the excellent switching behavior of these devices, which we will cover in more detail in later slides um, is useful. And they're very useful in the DC to DC converters in cars as well. Um, the same characteristics of low switching losses, easy gate drive, good thermal performance, means they'll also be useful in totem pole PFC in a data center, for example, and in the LLC circuits used there. The same applies for telecom rectifiers. And in, then the, in the renewable space, whether it's in solar inverters, choppers, or in the energy storage systems that need bidirectional energy flow. Here is a table benchmarking the G4 silicon carbide FET technology at 750 volts versus um, several suppliers of silicon carbide MOSFETs and the best in class fast superjunction technology at 600 volts. So the first row, first two rows on RDSA at 25C and 125C show that whether you look at it at 25C or 125C, the RDSA of this 750 volt technology is by far superior to all the technologies out there. Uh, this means that for a given RDS on, the chips that you need are smaller with the Gen 4 SIGFET technology. And this difference becomes really quite large when you compare it to superjunction MOSFETs. The threshold voltage of these devices is designed to be nearly five volts. So it is quite a lot higher than most silicon carbide MOSFETs and somewhat higher than that of superjunction FETs, more in line with silicon IGBTs. The preferred gate drive for these devices is zero to 12 volt for the G4 silicon carbide FET, which is a much smaller range than for all the silicon carbide MOSFET options, many of which require a negative gate drive as well. And it, you can actually use a zero to 10 volt gate drive at higher frequencies without any loss in performance. The QG times V product helps you understand the amount of gate drive loss that you will sustain using these devices. And you can see it's dramatically lower, not only than all the silicon carbide MOSFET options, but also the silicon superjunction device option, which means you can run at high frequencies without overheating the driver. Looking at the diode drop at 25C, you can see why this device is unique in the world of wide band gap semiconductors because the on-state drop in the third quadrant is about three times or more lower than silicon carbide MOSFETs and just a little higher than 
silicon superjunction devices. However, what's important is this, this low forward drop comes with a very low operating QRR, which leads to the VF times QRR figure of merit. And when looked at from that perspective, you can see that this device is really by far uh, the best technology on the market. We can use RDS EOSS figures of merit to understand if what the fundamental capability of a given technology is for hard switching. So you can see G4 SIGFETs lead the way there. And even more important, when you come to soft switching, you can use the RDS times COSS TR figures of merit to you know, see how low the conduction losses are that you can get and how fast you can charge the output capacitance. And here too, there is a big jump, a big improvement in the Gen 4 technology relative to silicon superjunction devices. And it is best in class compared to all the silicon carbide MOSFET options as well. When you combine this with the low gate drive losses of the G4 technology, it really is the best option for soft switch circuits. Before we spend time on the switching behavior of these devices, let's take a quick look at the datasheet characteristics of the 18 milliohm 750 volt SIGFET generation four. Um, from the IV curves, this is you know, common to all the SIGFET devices. The current in the device is controlled by the JFET. Therefore, once the gate is enhanced past 10 volts, there's not much change in the RDS on. The on resistance change with temperature is shown on the second plot on the top, on the, on the top row. Uh, the on resistance increases with temperature fairly quickly. At 175C, you can see it's 2.3 times higher than at room temperature. This must be accounted for when you're evaluating losses in different applications. The threshold voltage of the input silicon MOSFET stays high and it's above three volts, even at 175C. This is why excursions in operating temperature to 200C are not difficult for the device to sustain. On the lower row, you see the diode performance on the lower left. You can see the on-state voltage drop is only 1.5 volts, even at 40 amps, with uh, any negative applied gate voltage. The QRR at the same time is low and temperature independent. It's just about, just a little over 100 nanocoulomb at 400 volts and 120 nanocoulomb at 500 volts, because essentially it's just the charging capacitance uh, charging the charge needed to charge the COSS of the device. The last plot on the lower right is the output is the capacitance curves, the low input capacitance 1400 picofarad or so, the low output capacitance of the device nearly just about 100 picofarad at higher voltages, and what's most important, the near zero reverse transfer capacitance. The data sheets for these devices contain a lot of information on how they switch, what the switching losses are. There is data on half bridge mode and chopper mode switching. Here we'll just take a look at the half bridge switching in two types of circuits. One in which just simply the RG is used to control the device and the other where an RC snubber, RS1, CS1, is applied across, across each device. All of the switching is done with a zero to 15 volt gate drive in both cases, an RC snubber is used across the bus, which helps to damp the ringing in, at the phase node. This slide looks at the switching behavior in Toyota 47.4 lead for the two Gen 4 devices that have just been launched. The top row looks at the 60 milliohm 750 volt device, and the bottom one looks at the 18 milliohm 750 volt device. Switching for the top row is done at 20 amps, 400 volt bus, and the bottom row is 50 amps and 400 volt bus, all through a single Toyota 47 device. So in the top row, we are comparing with dashed lines what the waveforms look like if we use a low value of RG, just one ohm, with a 10 picofarad, sorry, 10 ohm, 95 picofarad snubber. And we compare that to the solid lines where we've used an RG on of 25 ohms and an RG off of 20 ohms. So the top left figure shows the turn on curve. The right figure is a turn off. So looking at the turn on, we can see that 25 ohms allows you to slow down the turn on DIDT quite a lot. The turn on DVDT is not significantly affected. The gate drive waveforms though are quite different in, this, in these cases with a longer turn on delay with the 25 ohms. Looking at the turn off waveforms on the top right, 
the delay time gets a lot longer using, of course, a 20 ohm gate resistor. We have chosen these numbers to get similar levels of voltage overshoot at turn off, but you can see that with the dashed snubber lines, the voltage ringing is reduced and the gate waveforms in fact look better. However, for 20 amps and below, we find that both these power loss numbers are quite good. The waveform is manageable, so the use of the snubber is optional. When we get down to the lower plot, where we are looking at 50 amp switching, now here we compare the, what happens when you use just a 1 ohm RG with a 10 ohm 350 puff snubber across each device, or we use a 25 ohm RG on 50 ohm RG off to manage the 50 amp high current switching. Now these values were chosen to give us a similar level of overshoot for the drain source voltage at turn off. And now we see at 50 amps, there is really quite a big difference in the power losses between the case with the snubber and the case where we just use the gate resistances to manage the switching waveforms. And with the snubber, both the turn on loss and the turn off loss are dramatically lower. At the same time, because the RG can now be much smaller, the delay times are shorter, especially at turn off. So, you know, you get almost a 36% loss reduction using the snubber. The losses in the snubber are, are extracted in the data sheet and are quite small. Therefore, for greater than 25 amp switching, it is recommended to go with the four leaded package and to use the snubber option. A lot of applications still use the Toyota 47 three lead device. Um, and we would like to compare it here to what happens for the, with the same parts in three lead versus four lead switching in the half bridge. So again, the top row is looking at the 60 milliohm device. The bottom row of figures looks at the 18 milliohm 750 volt device. The top row switches 20 amps at 400 volts and the bottom one 50 amps at 400 volts. For the top row, we examine the case of switching without snubbers across the device, just using an RG on of one ohm, RG off of 20 ohm, and the dashed lines refer to the four leaded package, the solid lines, the three leaded package. And as one would expect, if you look at the turn on curve for the 60 milliohm device, top left figure, the gate ringing is significantly worse if you're using the three leaded device. And most of that ringing occurs because of the DIDTs acting across the common source inductance. The same happens at turn off, where even though the voltage overshoot with a solid line in the three leaded package is lower, the gate waveform has significantly bigger spikes. Again, same reason, is because of the DIDT acting across the common source inductance. Now, in the, at the bottom, in the bottom set of figures, we are talking about switching a much higher current, 50 amps. And in this case, the waveforms have been taken with the same low RG, but using a device snubber to get better operating waveforms. Again, when you compare the three lead to the four lead, the noise on the gate is greater in the three leaded package, especially at turn off. Even when you've got similar levels of current and voltage overshoot um, by the choice of uh, operating conditions. So a four leaded package again offers here a much lower switching loss and better gate waveforms. So again, for high current applications, we recommend the four leaded package and the use of the device snubbers. Now let's look at a few examples for what these excellent switching characteristics can do for us in typical applications. So this first application is a standard high line totem pole PFC application at 65 kilohertz for a 3.6 kilowatt um, PFC unit. The, all the FETs use a zero to 15 volt gate drive. The left plot takes a look at uh, using SIG FETs in both the fast switching leg and the so slow switching leg. Whereas the right hand plot compares what happens when you replace the slow switching leg with just regular silicon rectifier diodes. For low, because that saves two gate drives and two transistors and therefore is lower cost. So on the left side, we can see that at 3.6 kilowatts, we really have two options. We can use two paralleled 60 milliohm devices, which can give you the peak efficiency, including at light load, or we can save some gate drive 
and some heat sinking space by using a single 18 milliohm device, which has comparable efficiency. If the system is lower power, say around 1.5 kilowatts, the blue line shows that it's good enough to use just one 60 milliohm device. The improvement from Gen 3 to Gen 4 can be seen, especially at light and medium load. The um, right-hand side plot, you can see that the drop in efficiency that occurs from the yellow line, for instance, to the black line, it shows what happens when you um, remove this transistor from the slow leg and replace it with a silicon diode, which leads to greater conduction losses and that efficiency drop. But in either case, the semiconductor losses that are plotted here exclude all the other losses from the inductor, the chokes, the control circuitry, etc. But they are high enough that it makes it possible to implement extremely efficient PFC units and maybe hit the, the, the highest standards for power conversion. The LLC circuit is by far the most popular circuit for DC to DC conversion, whether it's in EVs, data centers, telecom rectifiers, or other applications. So here we take a look at a 3.6 kilowatt LLC case. There are two important options here, either using two devices of the 60 milliohm in parallel or one of the 18 milliohm. And you can see from the table, we take a look at 300 kilohertz and 500 kilohertz operation. We break out the conduction loss, the turn off loss, P off, the gate drive loss, P gate, and the diode conduction loss, P diode, which then adds up to the total loss per device you can see that both options are excellent. Um, gate drive losses are low in all cases. Uh, all, the good, all the features of the silicon carbide FETs are employed here. The low conduction loss, the low switching loss, very low gate drive loss, and the low diode loss. Even in the worst case, the losses are below 6.5 watts, which means the temperature rise is gonna be very minimal and very little heat sinking is required especially given the fact that the R theta JC of the devices is so good. So because these generation four devices come in the same packages like silicon superjunction FETs, and they can use the same zero to 10 volt gate drive, they have much lower gate charge, maybe six times and significantly improved switching figures of merit. We think that they provide a very simple migration path for mid to high end superjunction FETs um, to be replaced with these silicon carbide FETs. The cost competitiveness comes from the vastly superior on resistance per unit area of the SIG JFET technology. So in summary, we've discussed the generation four 750 volt silicon carbide FETs just launched by United Silicon Carbide. We talked about the two devices, 18 milliohm and 60 milliohm, offered in the Toyota 47 three lead and four leaded packages, which have been qualified to the AEC Q101 standard. We showed that these devices have pretty breakthrough figures of merit for hard and soft switching. The gate drive is pretty simple. You can be, be as simple as just using a zero to 10 volt gate drive because of the five volt threshold. Um, these are the first 750 volt devices because we wanted to serve not just the traditional 300 and 400 volt bus applications, but also the emerging, emerging 500 volt bus applications. So this is what uh, is gonna to lead to all the benefits in the high growth applications like EVs in onboard chargers and DC-DC converters, in the data centers and telecom rectifiers, in energy storage systems and in solar inverters. This is just the start of the portfolio. There's a much wider portfolio of RDS songs, package types, and voltage classes planned for 2021. Thank you for your attention.